a pleasure to welcome John Padon. We'll talk about Pantragin Tom for Abbey Falls. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. Um, <clears throat> so, the Pantragin Tom construction is a very classical construction in algebraic topology. It, um, what it does is allows um, one to understand borders and groups of manifolds, which come in many, many different flavors. Um, in terms of stable homotopy theory. Um, and um, this, this correspondence, this isomorphism is, is useful in both directions. Um, so what I'd, what I'd like to uh, explain today is uh, how to make this work for, uh, for orbifolds. In, um, so, so first let's just uh, begin by explaining what, what the Pontrag and Tom construction in, in the classical um, setting is. So, um, what, what are bordism groups? So let's let's consider the, uh, the set of all uh, closed K manifolds, and we'll call two of these equivalent if there's a compact manifold with boundary um, W whose whose uh, whose boundary is the disjoint union of of, of our two, two manifolds. So so this looks like this. So if I have um, maybe this is M, and this is M prime, they are cobordant, and only if there's some uh, manifold W of dimension one larger, whose boundary is is M union M prime. Um, now this is this is certainly an equivalence relation because if I have um, another bordism um, Q from from M to M double prime, then I can just glue W and Q along M prime and get a cobordism from, from M to M double prime. Um, it's also obviously reflexive and symmetric. So, so this is an equivalence relation and, and the quotient is the bordism group of manifolds, manifolds modulo bordism. So what I said um, right now, just now it, it ha had no qualifiers as opposed as to sort of what sort of manifolds I'm considering. So, so this is called unoriented bordism, but it comes in many, many other flavors. You can look at um, bordism of oriented manifolds, bordism of manifolds with a spin structure, with a stable, almost complex structure, stable SU structure, or, or with a stable framing, um, or and, and, and any number of other things. Um, what is a stable framing? Well, a, a framing is just a trivialization of the of the tangent bundle that is, and in linearly independent, and vector fields which at every point are are, are linearly independent. Um, a stable framing is um, the same thing, uh, but for the stable tangent bundle. So you're allowed to add a trivial bundle to the tangent bundle, and and, and then you frame that. So. Um, the, the, the reason I explained that uh, in particular is that uh, the, the stably framed bordism, this is the context in which the Pontrag and Tom construction is somehow, um, well, the simplest on, on, on the stable homotopy side. Okay, so, so what does the Pontrag and Tom construction do um, in, in this classical world? So let's consider maps from the n plus k sphere to the n sphere, which send the base point to the base point. And here, here my base point is infinity. Um, so that just means we send infinity to infinity. Equivalently, the, the inverse image of a compact set is compact. So, and, and, and what we'd like to do is, is understand maps like this up to homotopy. So um, we can define an invariant of such a map as follows. So, um, you perturb f to be transverse to zero. And then we look at um, the fiber over zero. So uh, the source is k dimensions bigger than the target. So this fiber is, is generically, it's a k-manifold somewhere in inside um, this Rn plus k. It's a closed k-manifold, um, right? It's, it's, it's compact because, uh, because f sends infinity to infinity. So the inverse image of this is compact. So zero is compact. So we get a k-manifold um, for, for, for many map f like this. We get a closed k-manifold. And in fact, it's not just any closed k-manifold. It comes naturally equipped with a stable framing um, because 
uh, the derivative of your map. Well, it's, this is a map from um, it is a map from R n plus k to R n, and the kernel is just the, the tangent space to the fiber. Um, so okay, I, I distinguish um, the, the, the trivial bundle R n uh, by by this underline. So this is a trivial bundle R n plus k over some space uh, versus the, just simply the space R n. Okay, so so we're we're in we're in a topological setting, so all short exact sequences split. So this is the same thing as just a, an isomorphism between uh, the tangent space to f inverse of zero uh, plus r n and and r n plus k. So this is exactly a stable frame. Okay, and and similarly, if you have a one parameter family of maps, you get a bordism, a stably framed bordism between two two. Um, of these, the, the inverse image of zero in the two maps. So, so really, what we're saying is that um, this construction defines a map from um, homotopy classes of maps from S n plus k to S n to the bordism group of um, frame stably framed k manifolds. Um, now, in in this construction, it didn't really matter what n was. N was just any sort of, well, really any integer at all. Um, and there's also a natural stabilization operation, which increases n. So, so really, um, it's best to think of this, the domain of this map as really being the, the direct limit over, over n of, of this group. Great. Um, so now we can, in fact, we can also go in the reverse direction. So, so suppose we have a, um, a closed K manifold with a stable framing. Let's produce um, let's produce a homotopy class of maps. Let's invert this correspondence. Um, so while of course the first thing we should do is we should embed our manifold as a subset of R to the n plus K. Now, now thankfully this is always um, always possible. So um, given any manifold. Um, we can always choose capital N large enough so that there's an embedding of our manifold into RN. Moreover, this is a contractible choice. So um, if I have a K the M parameter family of embeddings of my manifold into RN, I can always choose, uh, I can always increase N such that that K parameter family becomes uh, homotopic to constant. Okay, now what about the issue of the framing? This is a little bit um, tricky because uh, we, ch we chose our embedding M into, into Rn plus K. Um, and that gives us an inclusion of um, the tangent bundle of, of M into Rn plus K. But um, that need not agree with, um, with the original um, with with a stable framing of this, um, unfortunately, that we can always in, since we're allowed to increase n, um, we can assume that, that, that this derivative is, is homotopic to i, and so okay, and so uh, what 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 we now then have is a trivialization of the normal bundle. The T m is embedded in R n plus k, and the quotient. Um, in view of the stable trivialization of TM is um, is identified with R. So, so let me draw the picture of what, what we've what we've obtained. So we took our arbitrary manifold, we embed it into R R n plus K. It has this image E of M. And um, a, a tubular neighborhood of that embedding is identified with M cross R M because we've, we've trivialized the normal bundle. So then, um, well, there's just some ob an obvious projection map. Project to, to Rn defined on this tubular neighborhood. And, and anything which is, um, which is away from the tubular neighborhood, I'm just going to map to, map to infinity. 
So, so we get from this um, construction, a map from Rn plus K to Rn modulo infinity. What does it do? On, on, on the complement of, of this, we just map to infinity. And when, when we're in, in this tubular neighborhood, we just use this projection to Rn. So this exactly um, inverts the previous construction. But given this stably framed manifold, we get a map from Rn plus K to Rn, who's such that the inverse image of zero is, 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 this, is exactly this, the stably framed manifold that we started with. Okay, and you, you, can, you can check that you do this construction um, on, a, on a boardism, um, and you, get a, you can get a homotopy of maps. So, um, so the result is that um, you get a map in the other direction from, from any stably framed manifold up to bordism, you can get a, a homotopy class of maps from, from a sphere to a sphere. Okay, and it's essentially um, by definition that these are inverses of each other. Once you show these maps are well-defined, it's obvious that they're, they're inverses. Each other and, and so we get this isomorphism, which, which is the Pontrug and Tom. Just to make sure, the limit is there uh, for the equivalence to make sense, right? From the, the first yes. map does not need a limit. Indeed, yes. The first map did not be, need the limit. The second map did. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, great. So, so on the left, we have this uh, geometry side and, um, and, and, and on, on the right, we have the stable homotopy theory. Um, so th this is a very classical construction. So as, as you might expect, it's been generalized in, in many different directions. Um, you can talk about um, homology theories, which are you know, giving, giving, a, giving a space um, a cycle is a map from a manifold to that space, uh, modulo bordism. Um, so that's a bordism. Um, right, bordism gives you an entire homology theory um, for spaces. This group that I wrote here on the left is just um, the value of that homology theory on the point. Um, and the Pontiac and Tom construction generalizes to this as well. You can, you can describe this homology theory in terms of some stable homotopy um, theoretic constructions. You can also um, look at manifolds with structure. So instead of um, framed manifolds, you can look at oriented manifolds. Like I said, all, all these flavors of boredism, they Pontrag and Tom instruction works for them as well. It also works for um, in the equivariant setting. Um, it's a little bit more subtle there. And I've, I've, um, it's not always an isomorphism, or at least one has to work harder it's to, to define the correct groups of it. It is an isomorphism. Um, and I, think, I think, in fact, it's just not an isomorphism for general um, compact Lie groups if you want to work equivariantly. Say, bordism of manifolds with the group action, um, and then some G equivariant groups over here. Right, so, so the, the generalization I want to talk about, though, is, is um, to the setting of orbifolds. OK, so, so what is? What is an orbifold? So maybe I first just remind you what is a manifold. Um, so a manifold is a is a space, um, and it's in the equipped with it's equipped with a bunch of charts. Chart being a pair, U, um, an open set of R n and phi from U to M uh, being an open inclusion. Meaning, meaning it's a it's a homeomorphism onto its image, and its, and its image is open. So that's what I've drawn here: um, a manifold and, and some some charts. Um, so, moreover, it has the property that um, the transition maps are smooth. So if I take two, um, meaning that if I take two charts, U and V, um, and and they have some overlap here, then um, I can take the inverse image of that overlap in U, and I can also take the inverse image of that overlap 
in V and then pushing forward by AU and, and pulling back under VV gives me a map, uh, a homeomorphism between these two open sets and that should be a diffeomorphism. It should be a smooth map in both directions. So that's what it means for to have a, a smooth manifold. Um, now a smooth, to have a smooth orbifold, it's, it's exactly the same definition except um, except my local model is not Rn, but rather um, Rn modulo G for G a finite group. And here um, I, I should probably specify G acting on Rk is, is just a, a, a linear representation. Um, and, and you, you can have a different group for, for every chart. Right. So, so there's a subtlety, additional subtlety to this definition, which I um, want to at least mention, but won't explain in detail. So orbifolds are not topological spaces. They're something slightly more complicated, topological stacks. And the additional data that this word well, one of the things that this, this word gives you, um, which the topological space does not give you, is that to each uh, point, um, now, my, now my pen is not working, to each point in the orbifold, um, you, you get a group. There's a group attached to it, which is called the, the isotropic group at that point. So to every point x in, in the orbifold, you get um, you get a group gx attached to it. Um, and what, what that what that group is is it's exactly the the stabilizer of of the corresponding point in the chart. So if you have some point in Rn, um, if you have a point in Rk and g is acting on Rk, you have, you can look at the stabilizer at that point. Um, and and uh, if you have a point on the orbifold, um, it, it remembers that that stabilizer. So, so for example, um, if you took something like R two and you quotient by um, x comma y is equal to minus x comma minus y, um, as a topological space, this is homeomorphic to just R two. Um, but as an orbifold, um, it's not a stacky quotient. It remembers the fact that the origin was fixed by this action, whereas the other points are not. So as an orbifold, this quotient um, has some sort of special point at zero. Okay. So, so these groups, um, the fact that th these groups are not always trivial is, is source for lots of um, interesting things that happen for, for orbifolds. Okay, so there, there are two directions of the Pontryagin and Tom construction. Yes. What do you mean by diffeomorphism between a piece of these two quotients? Yeah, I mean, I guess I mean, um, I mean, I, I can just some sort of throw out some words. Um, but, um, so I guess, uh, let's see. Um, so here, here's, here, here, here's, oh, here's, here's a better answer than just throwing out some words. Um, one one thing would be to say, well, I, I give a I give a um, a map from from G to H, and and I, and I give an equivariant map between invariant open sets, and that should be smooth. That that that's, that 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 would induce a smooth map from um, from from the quotients. Um, so something which locally is like is 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 like that. 
And then diffeomorphism, of course, means smooth in both directions. And the map is a homeomorphism. Um, well, I should say I, 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 isomorphism of topological stacks, I have to say. But do, right. Yeah. Do we have a a uh, an easy example that's not affine? That's not affine. Um, affine in the sense that you really glue two things together. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So so I mean. Oh, so you could take R two for example. Take R two with this. Take this quotient. Um, and then um, compactify at infinity by adding just the way you usually compactify R2 at infinity to get S2. Except now, what you don't get, you don't get S2, you get S2 with, with, uh, with a single orbifold point. Like called the oh, teardrop or, or orbifold. Um, so this is not a global quotient. You cannot express this as a quotient of a manifold by a, by a group. How about one that you glue along singularities? Uh, I mean, non-free points. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could, I mean, you can take something like, well, anytime you quotient by the trivial, you can also quotient by the trivial action. You're allowed to do that. And if your group is non-trivial, then quotienting by the trivial action, um, it's not this, it, I mean, it actually does something because the stack remembers the fact that there's non-trivial isotropy. So you can take, um, say like S1 cross um, just a point mod G or, or S2 cross a point mod G. And these are orbifolds. I mean, this is just the global quotient S1 modulo the trivial action of G or S2 modulo the trivial action of G. Um, but you can do, um, you can do more interesting things where um, there are orbifolds which are um, locally isomorphic to this, um, but are not globally. Somehow the, 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 um, the group twists as you go around the one sphere or as you go around the two sphere. Thanks. Right, so there, there are two directions for Pontryagin and Tom. We, we have um, the first direction I explained where you go from a, some, some map, some stable homotopy theory, theoretic object, um, you perturb it to be transverse and, and you get a, some, something on the geometric side, some manifold, the zero set. And then the, there's the other direction where you go from a uh, orbifold with some framing to some stable homotopy theoretic data. Um, so both of these acquire some new features in the orbifold context. So let's talk about the first one first. So that's that's about transversality. So let's begin with the bad news. So um, if you have an orbifold and you have a vector bundle over it, so what what that gives you in particular is um, if you have a point of your orbifold. Okay, we know we have this um, finite group, the isotropy group. Um, so the, the fiber over that point. It's, it's a vector space. Fiber of your vector bundle over the point is a vector space, um, which, which carries an action of, of the isotropy group, the linear representation. Um, right. So in, in contrast to the setting with M as a manifold, um, it's possible to have a vector bundle with no section, which is transverse to zero. So there's a familiar fact that if you have a vector bundle over a manifold and you take a generic section and you look at zero set, then, then that um, is the Euler class. That, that sub-manifold represents the Euler class in cohomology. But if you're over an orbifold and you have a vector bundle and you try to do the same thing, you might be faced with a situation that there simply isn't any transverse section at all. So, so here's just a very simple example of why that, wh 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 why this happens. Um, so I mean, there are even local obstructions to, to transversality. 
So, so let's take any two linear representations of G um, and let's use the first one of MV. So V modulo G, this is our orbifold, this is M. And E will, well, it's not exactly W. Um, it's some um, version of the trivial vector bundle W where we take into account this, this representation G. So um, at, at this, um, at the point zero um, here in V mod G, the fiber of this vector bundle is W um, with, 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 the, with the G action. Okay, so then we ask, what, can, can we find a section transverse to zero here? Um, so the section, what is it about its value at zero? Its value at zero has to be an invariant vector in W. And, and let's just assume there are none. So certainly easy to, to find W with that property. Um, so S, S of naught is, S of zero is zero. Um, so if, if we have a, um, now a section, it's derivative at zero, which is defined since S vanishes at zero. Um, it's just a G equivariant map from W to V and it's, for, for, for S to be transverse to zero, we want this to be surjective, but of course, it, it's very easy to choose two representations which just don't have any Homs between them. Um, and then, um, then we're just stuck. There's no, um, there's, and, and, and every section you could possibly have vanishes at zero and its derivative vanishes at zero. So that's certainly not gonna be transverse. So th there are there are so-called um, derived orbifold borders and groups. I won't really make a definition of those. Um, the definition is very interesting, but um, an orbifold is an orbifold. A derived orbifold is something which looks locally like um, the, the zero set of a, an orbi bundle over an, a, a, an orbifold. And you can form borders and groups of these derived orbifolds. And they don't agree with the borders and groups of honest orbifolds. And then this difference is a strong measurement of this um, fact. Anyway, um, there's, there's a, a theorem of, of Wasserman, which, which tells you how to get around this problem. So it gives you a situation where, where you can perturb sections of orbit bundles to be transverse. So this is an, an old result, I think yeah, I'm probably remembering wrong about 1969. Say. Okay, so take M orbifold, any, take any vector bundle. And suppose we have a linear map such that every, at every point, um, Right, so, so, so what do I want to do? So alpha is a map from the tangent bundle to your vector bundle. So then at, at, at every point, I get a map um, AP from, from the fiber of the tangent bundle to the fiber of EP, fiber of E at P, and the isotropy group acts on both of these. So this is a map of GP representations. And what I want to do is restrict it to the, the non-trivial isotopic pieces. So just throw away all the copies of the trivial representation to, to get this map here, just throw away copies of trivial representation. So, so we get this, um, this map and we assume that this is surjective. So if M is a manifold, this is no condition because then there are no isotropy groups. So they're only at all. So, so, so this is purely the trivial representation always. So this, there's, there's no condition here. Um, but at the orbifold points, um, some, there, there's some non-trivial thing to, to, be, to be set. Um, and there, there, there is some non-trivial um, information contained in this map at the orbifold points. Okay, so if, if this is, 
if this is the case in, in this in the setup. Um, and then there is a transverse section. In fact, any in fact, transverse sections are dense. Any section, it's a, a C0 small perturbation, which is transverse to zero. So, and basically the proof consists of saying, well, you, you're going to use alpha as a guide for what to do in the directions um, a transverse to um, the natural strata, the, the strata of the natural stratification of M by, by isotropy group. Excuse me, can you say what the subscript means? Alpha sub G and T sub P sub G and all that? Let's see. So, so um, sub P just means I take the fiber at P. So this is just the map um, on the fiber over, um, over P. Um, and, and this thing here, removing this um, sub G hat minus one, that means, so, so the thing inside here is a representation of G. And I and I remove all I remove the invariant part. So so I take the subspace on which G acts trivially and, and I quotient by that. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. So you so you might know this. Um, so you remove the trivial pieces and the map. Should still be surjective. Um, it, it should be surjective after removing trivial pieces. Right. So, so I, I impose no condition on what happens before you remove these pieces. Sort of, it's like transversal to the trivial part. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I guess I, I didn't really need to remove them from the domain. That's right, I just, just need to remove them from the target. So um, you might know this over a, um, <clears throat> over a manifold, um, every section has a C infinity small perturbation, which is transverse to zero. This is only C zero small. So a slight difference, but. Um, so it's false for C one small? Um, the, the proof fails. So I, um, the, proof, the proof needs to make a C one big perturbation. I would assume it's false, but I, I haven't tried to think of a counter example. I mean, the whole, the whole point is somehow you do your inter, you, you, on each stratum you perturb, and then you just sort of force the derivative in the normal direction to be equal to alpha. That's going to screw up the rest of the argument of Tom Pontryagin. Um, I hope not. I don't think so. We'll, um, anyway, I, well, I, I'd like to say we'll see, but I, 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 I'm, I'm, there's no time to give all, all the details. But. Um, right. Um, okay, so, so for, for Orbel, what, 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 what does this transversality result give you? Um, I'm just going to state the, the simplest um, output of the, of the flavor of taking something from the stable homotopy world and getting to the geometric world. Um, um, what one needs to do some considerable work on both sides to identify them with the, the groups one cares about. Um, but just, um, just for a simplest example, um, so this is this is some piece of homotopy theoretic data. We, we, okay, we fix our orbital fold. Then what do we ask for? We ask for an open set, a vector bundle over the open set, or surjection from the tangent bundle of the open set to that vector bundle, um, and a section with compact zero set. Yeah, 
And so we take this modular homotopy. This is, this is a homotopy theoretic thing. Um, and Wasserman's theorem tells you that we can, we can, we can, we can, this, this is enough data to perturb S to be transverse. And so we get a, a map to, to this set. So close sub orifolds modulo, um, modulo bordism. Bordism embedded in, uh, bordism embedded in, 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 in M cross zero. Oh, okay. so let's now talk about the other way, other direction. Okay, so so let's remember what, what we did for a manifold. So um, for a closed manifold, what, what we did is we, um, right, so, so we're going from geometric side to, to homotopy side. We have a, a manifold we want to embed it in some, uni sorry, we have an orbifold we want to embed in some universal space so that we can uh, and, and identify some, some homotopy theoretic data that we get out of that. Okay, so why do we like to embed manifolds in Rn? Well, it's because homotopy, theoretically speaking, it's no data. There's no space of such embeddings is contractible. And I want to think of that, um, um, that fact is coming from two key properties of Rn, which, which are um, distinct. So first, it's contractible. Rn is contractible. So the space of all maps to Rn is contractible. Second, um, Rn is high dimensional. So, um, so what does this mean? It means that a generic map to Rn um, is an embedding. It means that a generic one parameter family of maps to Rn is um, an embedding on each fiber. It means, in fact, it means the generic K parameter family of maps from a manifold to Rn um, <clears throat> um, it is, um, is completely contained inside the locus of maps which are embedding. Um, here, and, and of course, has to be very large in terms of K. Um, right, so in the succinct way of saying that is just the, the locus of maps which fail to be embeddings has, has high co-dimension. Its co-dimension goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. So if we want to do Pontryag and Tom for orbifolds, we should just do the same thing. We should find a, a sequence of spaces which um, um, fulfill this property of Rn. Um, so so turns out we can do that. Um, so, so first of all, though, um, it's not the space of all maps that should be contractible. It's the space of representable maps. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, representable, we can we can pretend that actually uh, we, we can define it as, as meaning injective on isotropic groups. Um, so it's, it's only representable maps which have any chance of being an embedding in the first place. Um, so we might as well restrict attention to those. And um, for for property two, for to, to ensure that um, the locus of embeddings, which sorry, the locus of smooth maps, which are not embeddings, to have high co-dimension, um, not only do we need um, the tangent spaces to and, and then to be some high dimensional. In fact, when we look at TMN as a representation of each isotropy group, we need all the isotopic pieces um, to be high dimensional. So we need all the representations of, of the isotropy group to, to occur with high multiplicity. And, 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 then, um, and then this is true. That's a generic map is an embedding, et cetera. Did you say that M sub N was some kind of object? It's a manifold with some group structure acting on it or something? It, it's an orbifold. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, it's written there, okay. Yeah, yeah just a compact orbifold with boundary. Um, Um, right. Okay, so this this property one it specifies a unique homotopy type. Um, this is not surprising; it's some sort of universal property of what maps into it is. So, so it, it should specify it uniquely. Um, is given by this somewhat complicated um, complicated thing. Um, this 
here it's basically it's it's the you take the two category of finite groups injective maps and conjugations and you take the nerve um, well you take something modeled on the nerve but um, you, you take point modulo g naught here so and and we'll call that um, that space r of a point so there's a reason to call it this but but for now this is just notation so this is this is an orbi space the unique orbi, orbi space with the property that the map the, the space of maps to it um, is contractible for any input orbi space sorry the space of representable maps um so so this is a pretty big space it's some in, in, infinite complex um an individual MN we're just going to take to be compact. So it's just, it's, it's this direct limit, which, which ends up being hom homotopy equivalent to this. And we filter it basically however, it doesn't really matter. Okay, now the other thing, and now the next thing we need to do is, if we, well, we need to realize MN as an orbifold. So it, it begins life simply as a, as, as what I'd call, um, um, an or BCW complex. Um, I.e. it's glued out of cells, um, decay, boundary decay, cross point modulo G. Um, so just take usual cells in the, in the sense of a CW complex, but allow to, to take the product of any of those cells with point modulo G for a finite group G. So it's, it's, um, it's not too hard to check any, um, any CW complex um, can be realized. I mean, for any CW complex, you can find a compact manifold boundary, which is homotopy equivalent to it. Just for you just sort of turn each cell into a handle. Um, you just prove it by induction on cells. Each time you add a cell, you add a handle to your manifold. Um, um, to, to, to do this for orbifolds is, um, requires a little bit more, um, right. And, and what, what it requires is the following result. So on any compact Orbi space, so something like this finite Orbi CW complex, you can find global vector bundles, um, which at every point, um, contain all the um, representations of the ice traffic group at that point. Um, so locally, you can always find vector bundles with this. I mean, locally in Orbi space um, is, is going to be a Y modulo G. Um, and you can just take, you know, Y cross E modulo G. Maybe I should call this V Y cross y cross v modulo g for g acting on v uh maybe maybe this is the regular representation um so then the vector bundle you get like this um they call this e um will will be will be good um but but this is just give me the language of the uh Last line, all isotopic pieces of the representation are something are non-zero, are non-zero. So what does that sentence mean in normal language? Um, well, um, a sim and what is, what is non-zero? I mean, you know. Um, let me just, let me just give an, um, let me just write a simpler statement, which is equivalent. Um, so all representations GP on EP are faithful. Oh, okay. So why does GP act on EP? Um, this is more, um, Yeah, so um,
Right. So let, let's see how that fits. Right. So you have a essentially it's just by the definition of what, what we mean by an or, Orbi bundle. Um, but what one way to say it would be that um so here here's a um here's x to Orbi space. Um a map a, a point of x is a map from from the one point space into x. Um and, and we get this fiber ex um, being a vector bundle means means this is a vector space. Um, now the fact that x is a stack means that the space of maps from from a point into x is a groupoid, and so the, this this map um, has automorphisms. Now we usually don't think of maps as having automorphisms, but um, in the Orbi space context and the stacking context, they do. And 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 an automorphism of this of map is going to act on the on the vector space. Um, You're implicitly using the language of stacks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean that's yeah. Can I simply say because GP fixes P, um, so the action on E also fixes the fiber. Um. That's. So, I mean, one can think of GP as a purely somehow intrinsic, um, intrinsic thing to to the orbit to the orbit space X and and to the point. Um, and in that context, there's no somehow ambient space that G is acting on. There, I mean, it is a fact though that you near any point P, you can find a chart which is somehow Y modulo uh, GP inside X with with some you know base point y being fixed by gp corresponding to your point p in x and, and in that case yeah that's yeah gp fixes that point and so it fixes the fiber i see thanks um so you you sort of indicated the proof locally and then you say it can be put together um, I, 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 I didn't indicate the proof at all, really. Um, it's, I mean, okay. So what I, what is the, I, I, I can indicate the proof. Um, what is the proof? The proof is, um, so you, you want to do some sort of obstruction theory argument. You construct this vector bundle over the K skeleton of X and you want to extend it over the K plus one skeleton. And when you try to do this, you realize the obstructions are precisely the, the churn classes. Um, so, um, okay, well, you, you can't do it, but um, but then you say, okay, I'm I'm not going to construct act. I'm uh, sorry, I'm not going to construct a vector bundle. I'm going to construct a vector bundle um, with a trivialization of its churn character. The vector bundle um, together with a connection and a primitive for the churn form. So it's just a, a form gamma such that D gamma is the churn form associated to the connection. Um, and that problem, um, well, it still has obstructions, but the obstructions are, are all now torsion. So if you, if at the ex stage of extending from the K skeleton to the K plus one skeleton, you're allowed to replace your vector bundle with you know, the direct sum of N copies of it. Then, then you can make the extension work. Question. Thank you. Okay, so let's see. So the okay, these these roll vector bundles, they're sort of they play a similar role to trivial vector bundles. So. If, um, if, if you want to say any vector bundle you can embed into a trivial vector bundle. Um, this is no longer the case in the orbit space setting because of these isotropic group representations. It would be like saying you have to embed any representation into the trivial representation. Um, so instead, any vector bundle you, you try to, you would want to embed it into a direct sum of many, many copies of, of um, a vector bundle E as, as in the theorem. Okay. Okay, so so you, using this using this result, um, you you can you can construct these um, 
the sequence of orbifolds, Mn. And um, I don't have time to explain what all these objects here are on the left, but I want to explain what some of them are. So the most, um, but one interesting one is um, there's this category I'll call um, rep orb sp. This is um, representable Orby spectra. So the objects are um, usually write them like this. So um, x comma a, this is an Orby CW pair. So x is Orby CW complex. Um, a is a subcomplex. And c over x is a, a vector bundle. Um, so x comma a to the minus c, this is the formal d suspension of x of, of this space x modulo a um, by c. And um, anyway, this category is natural setting for for doing stable homotopy theoretic operations. Um, Sorry, this is finite. Um, finite. I should say finite. Everything's finite here. So th there's there's um there's an operation called Spanier Whitehead duality on 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 um, finite um, spectra. And what it does is if you have um if you have a manifold, um, then right, let, let me let me just draw a picture. So M is a manifold with boundary, um, and A is a codimension zero locus in its boundary. So it then has a complement boundary m minus a interior so so then um, the dual of this pair m comma a be suspended by a vector bundle is defined to be m relative complement of a um, D suspended by um, T uh, to, to V minus T, and um, you can so th this this is um, an involution of of the category of finite spectra D squared is um, is equal to one. Um, it's it's a monoidal dual in the sense that um, satisfies the, the universal property where um, maps from x wedge dual of y, x or x match the dual of y um, to z is the same as maps from x to y match z. Now, the same formula here, it also defines a map um, Um, an, an involution of this category of representable Orby spectrum. It is not as far, I, I, um, it is an involution. I do not know any universal characterization of it. It's not, as far as I know, characterized by any universal property like this. The only way I know how to define this um, operation, uh, which by the way is, is crucial in stating Pontryagin-Tom for, um, for orbifolds. 
Um, the only way I know how to state, um, uh, so define, sorry, define this, this operation is just by this explicit formula. You say for every orbifold M with boundary and the A, a compact suborbifold of, of, of its boundary, O dimension zero, uh, that, that this, just, this is what the dual is. Um, so I, I think it's somewhat interesting question to understand this, this duality operation better. So um, let me at least mention mention what this is. So there are um, cohomology theories which are um, <clears throat> represented by spectra. There are equivariant cohomology theories, like G equivariant cohomology theories, represented by equivariant spectra, genuine G equivariant spectra. Um, there are also so-called global cohomology theories, um, global spectra. And you could, one, one way of thinking about the global spectrum is it's sort of like having a compatible family of G spectra for every G. And what such an object gives you is it gives you a way to define cohomology theories, uh, define the cohomology of any orbifold or orbi space. Um, and that's what this is. So Stefan Schweda defines some of these. Um, global Tom spectra. One of them is as this name. And if you apply that to um, the sequence of orbifolds, or really rather that they're, they're dual, see this, this is the dual of, of MN, then, um, then you get closed orbifolds modulo, um, modulo vortism. Um, and I should conclude by, I'll, yeah, let me conclude by saying these cohomology theories, for Orbi spaces, they are functorial under all maps. All maps of Orbi spaces represent. Functorial under what? Under all maps of Orbi spaces, oh. not just representable maps, any map, uh, any map of stacks between two Orbi spaces. Um, I can get a homology theory by taking these cohomology theories and pulling back under the dual. The, the, the dual is, a, this is a contravariant. I didn't say that. This is a contravariant functor. So if I pull back a cohomology theory, I get a homology theory. The dual though is only defined on the representable subcategory, subcategory of representable maps. So if you take a cohomology theory and pull back under duality, you get a homology theory, but it's, it's a homology theory on this represent category of representable or perspective. It's not, as far as I know, functorial under arbitrary maps, only under representable maps. What does the adjective representable apply to and what does it mean? So it, um, any map of stacks, you can ask whether it's representable. Um, here, I'm only caring about Orbi spaces, uh, which are just stacks, which are locally the quotient of a space, a topological space by a finite group. And in that setting, um, it's equivalent to saying, so just the, the map on isotropy groups is injective. So a map, so, What's the context where the adjective applies and what does it mean? Would you say again? So it, it, it applies in a very general context of, 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 of a map of stacks. You can ask whether a given map of stacks is representable or not. Um, and what does, the it, only, mean? What does, it, what does mean? it mean? What does it mean there? Um, no, what does it mean in the con context of orbit context you're using? Just, uh, it, means, it means injective on isotropic groups. So, but it's a map of what? What, a what? map of orbifolds. A map, a map. If you have a map of orbifolds, then okay. Yeah. So if yeah, well, uh, yeah. So if, if you have a map um, from of orbifolds m to n, then um, you get you get an induced map from from from. A map of orbifolds groups. means a local isomorphism, right? No, just a local smooth map, not a local isomorphism. Okay. All right. I got to study stacks. I don't know what that means, but 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 you should go on. Okay. Well, I'm I'm done anyway. So. Well then, wait. So then, <laughs> you can keep asking. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, but then, but then you made us. I wanted to know that so I could understand the statement you made about homology and cohomology theory relative to maps or all maps or representable maps. Could you say yeah. that again, then? Yeah. Okay. Let, let me. Maybe I'll go down and get some get some more room. Um. 
Right, so um, we have the, the category of, um, of, of say, um, mm -hmm. let's just work with spaces so I don't have to, so, so it's, it's simpler. So we take uh, finite spaces, finite or finite CW pairs. And okay, we, we, we know what the cohomology theory is on, yeah. on, on this. Um, so, so then there, there are two categories of Orbi spaces I might want to consider. I might want to consider um, just finite Orbi CW pairs and maps between them. Or I might want to consider the representable maps. And the reason that representable maps are relevant is that um, this category, um, well, okay, it's, I, didn't, I didn't take spectra, so it's not triangulated, but um, it, it has mapping cones at least, it has a mapping cones, it has, um, has, has homotopy pushouts. Um, you can glue Orbi spaces along representable maps. Um, so, so that's why this is a nice category to, to consider. Um, so it's an Orbi version of the normal geometric category of CW complex. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's just as it's just as reasonable though to take all maps. Um, and this this category is, is not so nice because it doesn't have mapping cones. You can sort of add mapping cones in though and get slightly more general objects, which are not Orbi spaces. There's some more general stacks. Um, and and it's it's on, so, okay, so this is a subcategory. Um, Stefan Schweda's global cohomology theories exist on this category. So they are, they give their cohomology theories from this to functions from this to abelian groups. Um, now, bordism we know is a homology theory. So um, if we want to have a punch rock and Tom isomorphism, we better say that, um, you know, bordism of, is is um, is um, is isomorphic to some stable homotopy theoretic recipe for a homology theory, and what that recipe is is you take um, a, a cohomology theory on this category, you just pull it back under this tautological inclusion, and then um, and then you precompose with this uh, duality operation, which exists only here. Oh. And then, and it, and yeah. So, so then, then the conclusion is that um, um, this this cohomology theory uh, precomposed with D. This is equal to um, unoriented orbifold bordism. Um, this, this, so this is as as functors. In some sense, this is expected because um, so what so I didn't define I, all, all I defined was some uh, orbifold bordism of orbifolds. I didn't define a target space. Um, I didn't define it as a homology theory of, of orbi spaces. But you can, and some of the what seems to me to be the most natural definition is to take um, representable maps. So this is maps f from an orbifold to put the target here, x, orbifold to x, um, which are representable and, and divide by bordism. So, so then this, um, right, is, evidently is only going to be functorial under representable maps of X. And, and, and a representable map, as you said, is injective on the, is on the isotropic groups or something? Yeah. Okay. So perhaps we should... So in particular... Thank, thank you, President. Wait, 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 in the middle of a sentence. We can't have answers after clapping. It's the normal thing, Dennis. Hey, come on, Claude. No, I, I, I want to ask questions, but I, I wanted to clap first. That's the normal you thing, didn't, right? You didn't finish the sentence. <laughs>
Well, he's already seven minutes over time, so it's. So are you allowed to interrupt him in the middle of a sentence because he's over time? So what, what, what I was going to say is just, what, what was I going to say? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I was going to say that if, um, in, in the case X is a space, um, so I, 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 didn't, I didn't introduce any sort of decorations here. I didn't write like orbifold here in the superscript or anything. I just used the usual notation for or design. And the reason is because if I specialize to X being a space, a representable map to a space, space has trivialized Chapi groups. So um, you can only have a representable map to a space if your domain is also a space. So when X is a space, um, this orbifold, it actually has to be manifold. Can I ask a question? Yes. So um, it, it's sort of interesting that there are lots of uh, manifolds that don't bound manifolds, but they do bound orbifolds. For example, mm. say RP2 bounds mm -hmm. an orbifold. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the kernel of uh, the unoriented, co usual oriented cobordism groups mapping to the <laughs> orbifold cobordism? Yeah, I know. At least in low dimensions, I think bordism groups of orbifolds are known. I haven't done nearly as many calculations with this as I should have. Yeah, I was so sort of asking a simpler <laughs> question, you know, which, if you just look at the kernel of the, of the map from yeah. standard or, uh, cobordism to uh, orbifold cobordism, any amount of yeah. orbifolds so that makes perfectly good sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I, I I wish I know good I, I knew a good answer. I think that's the, I think that's the most I can really say. Um, so you you've been uh, emphasizing the unoriented case, but is there all there are also presumably good theories in oriented or stably almost complex or? Yeah yeah definitely just 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 for just for simplicity that's the only reason to talk about unoriented things here. So yeah these. The, so you can give an answer uh, to Claude's question uh, in the oriented case because orbifolds are rational homology manifolds and yes. Tom defined Pontryagin class as rationally for those things. So mm -hmm. it must be injective rationally. So all the infinite oh, parts okay. would be injective. So for complex boredism, it would be completely mm -hmm. injective. For space, oh, the okay. almost complex boredism. Well, mm -hmm. no, sorry. That's the torsion the, is probably hard, right? The, the, the kernel would be, in, in the oriented case, it would be two torsion and the rational part would inject. I mean, the infinite part would inject because you have the rational Pontryagin classes. Right, right. right. And it's conceivable that's right. So Stokes' theorem works perfectly well for orbifolds, is, is the source of that. <laughs> you can actually, you can actually uh, carry out uh, kind of a Durand proof of uh, the cobordism invariance of the of the, the real Pontryagin numbers, right? Uh, in the orbifold setting, just because Stokes works perfectly well for orbifolds. Right, this is, just, this is just saying you can forget the orbital structure and you still know the rational Pontryagin numbers. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. So, But it looks like there could be a, 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 a non trivial kernel on the, the, the torsion, the, 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 some torsion thing might, uh, might go to zero. It's interesting. Good question. So maybe we should clap again. Okay. Then uh, th thank you for your talk and thank you. Thank you.